Hello, you are listening to One in Two, a Manchester Cancer Research podcast, brought to you by the University of Manchester and the Manchester Cancer Research Centre. With one in two of us receiving a cancer diagnosis at some point in our lifetime, it has never been more important for our research to improve the outcomes of people affected by cancer. I am your host, Sally Best, and throughout this series, I will be speaking with Manchester cancer researchers about their innovations, discoveries and projects that are changing the landscape of lung cancer detection and treatment. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death worldwide, causing 35,000 deaths in the UK each year alone. As such, it is one of CRUK's four cancers of unmet need. Of 47,000 new lung cancer cases every year in the UK, 15% of those diagnosed are never smokers. Here in Manchester, we have one of the worst lung cancer mortality rates in England, so we are striving to improve early detection and treatment of this cancer. Across these episodes, we explore lung cancer from the genetics and diagnoses to screening and treatment, talking to Manchester researchers who specialise in basic, translational and clinical lung cancer research. And remember, you only need lungs to get lung cancer. In this episode, we speak to Dr Fabio Gomez about the commonality of lung cancer in never smokers. We focus on out-positive lung cancer, a type of non-small cell lung cancer that can occur in patients who have never smoked. He discusses his work on the ALK project and new funding for the ALK education programme, which will act to provide ALK positive education materials for patients and healthcare professionals across primary, secondary and tertiary care. Hello and welcome to another episode of One in Two Season 2. I'm so excited, are you? I am, I am. We've got with us the fabulous Fabio. I've been waiting all season to say that. (laughs) Alliteration is just... Well, is it alliteration? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we've got Fabio Gomez. Is that how you pronounce your second name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's Gomez. Gomez. Okay. Yeah, because it, 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 it's not a Z at the end, it's an S. So it, yeah. it just give it a slightly different accent. <laughs> <laughs> My accent is not on point. And where are you from? Portugal. Portugal. Yeah. Love and love Portugal. Yeah. Been on Holly Bob's there before. Yeah. It's an absolute great Far, place far to away be. land with a lot of sun. Yes, yeah. exactly. But we are, you know, it's sunny in England at the minute. Yeah. So we're yeah. loving it. Um, but I mean, we'll get on to why the mm-hmm. heck you left there for here. Because <laughs> that is the question. Um, but I mean, how are you doing? How's it all going? Yeah, yeah, it's going well. I'm busy. Um, yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot happening yeah <laughs> <laughs> which is great imagine. which is great but that does keep you busy yeah. but um yeah i think it's the i think it's one of those places that if you do have a lot of things that you're interested yeah. a lot of doors do open yeah uh, and i think that's why you know i ended up getting involved in a lot more than i probably yeah. should <laughs> that i have time <laughs> you're a busy for man. You're a very <laughs> but busy i enjoy man. it I'm sure you do. You always have a smile on your face. Um, So today we're going to be speaking about lung cancer and never smokers. Mm. So I think one of the rhetorics that we want to carry through this season is that you only need lungs to get lung cancer. And that's the message that we really want to kind of push. Um, And I think it's something, the stat changes, but I'm going to say around 14% of um, lung cancer patients are never smokers. So in this episode, I want to focus on ALK um, and the kind of, um, the things that you do. But I mean, I'm firstly wondering if you could give me a bit of background into you, who you are, what you do and what your day to day looks like, because you're a busy man. <laughs> yeah, no, happy to. So, um, so I'm, a, I'm a consultant medical oncologist. I work at the Christie. Been there for seven years now. Um, so I did all my training back in sunny Portugal, Lisbon, and then uh, I went for a little while to the US because I've been interested in, in research for a mm-hmm. while. But then actually moving to the US as a, as a medic is quite challenging because you need to do tests again and exams to get recognized. So realize, oh, that's a lot of effort to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so then I looked up in Europe and then I found, found Manchester as a good opportunity and yeah. moved to some research, but with the plan to, to go back to, to, to Lisbon at some point. But here I am, yeah. seven years later. <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, so I, I specialize in, in lung cancer. Yeah. So I've been, I've been working in that area for quite a few years now. And then I, and I have, and that's, that's the majority of, of, my, of, my, of my work. And that means, you know, the clinical side, seeing patients in clinics, going to the wards, MDTs, discussing new patients that got diagnosed, things like yeah. that. And then there are two other roles that I got involved over the years. One of them is looking at, so we have this clinical outcomes unit at the Christie. So mm-hmm. that's pretty much thinking, you know, the day-to-day practice generates a lot of data. So yeah. how can we use all that real-world data to really inform 
what's happening to our patients because yeah. you know you, you can google and find data from trials but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what's happening on the ground yeah so there's been a lot of interest in recent years about using more of that data so yeah so i took on that challenge to direct that the unit and then um another area of interest of mine is is the care for older patients with cancer so yeah. we are We've launched recently a, another unit looking at how can we best support those patients through through treatment when you're a little bit older and perhaps not as fit. Yeah. How and can we get you through? Yeah. yeah. And you work nine to nine, right? <laughs> yeah, it keeps me busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. And I mean, so you, yeah, you came to Manchester. I mean, what what kept you here? Was it just that whole diaspora? I mean, you've mentioned mm. that you work within the Christie NHS Foundation Trust. Like, what you know. You had plans to go back to sunny Lisbon. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's it's. I think it's a long answer, maybe because it's it's not something that you think oh, overnight or oh, th- this is it. I, I think yeah. I think it built up to a moment that I realized. Well, actually, why am I still thinking about it? Yeah. Probably, probably, I'm happy here. Yeah, oh, maybe I am. Oh yes, I am. <laughs> so so why 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 planning that? But I did I did come with that plan that we'll yeah. do a set up a research project. By the end of it, would go back. You know, as many research projects do, it got a little bit delayed. I said, oh, I'm going to stay a little bit longer. I want to see it through. And then I saw it through and then got involved with something else. And then yeah. one thing led to another. But I feel like overall, it has been the amount of doors that have mm. opened. I felt that I evol- it always nurtured my interests. It's not like someone, you know, open all the doors for you. But I feel yeah. like y- you can see the opportunities and you can mm. see, okay, I'm interested in this. And you can actually do something about it. And, and and I felt that that kept me quite engaged and quite motivated. And I yeah. guess that's why I am I end up doing all the things that I'm doing, because yeah. that environment was there to support it. And I think that was the main reason why I stayed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but it wasn't best. overnight. But it no, wasn't no, overnight. It took me a little not. while to realize. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the sun in Lisbon isn't so great. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> you just need to not go back and not remind yourself of how nice it is. Yeah. But we've, as I say, we've got the sun here. So I mean, specifically, can we focus on um, the non-small cell lung cancer component of your research and um, ALK positive? Mm. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, could you provide me some background detail on the non-small cell? Um, lung cancer side of things and what an ALK positive mutation is just for our um, audiences because it, it can be quite complex in describing but I'm sure you've got a very succinct way of okay. describing it don't look, so, <laughs> don't look so stressed about that all right I'll be succinct yeah um so so we we classify lung cancer in two big groups so you have non-small cell and small cell and None small cell will be about eighty five percent of patients, which is good because the small cell is 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 much worse mm-hmm. in terms of you know the chances of responding to treatment prognosis etc. So it gets very resistant to our treatments. None small cell is less aggressive and it has a higher chance that you can get you know the cancer control for many years, get even rid of it. Uh, which with small cell is 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 not that likely. So non small cell, you know, it is the most common. Most patients with lung cancer as a whole would would have a smoking history, but you may have non small cell without ever smoking, as you were saying before. Mm-hmm. And then we we subdivide non small cell in different. So you, you know, there's adenocarcinoma, squamous. Those are the two main ones. Um, but over the years, we've been looking at, because this is pretty much morphology. Mm-hmm. So over the years, we've been looking more and more into the molecular side of it. So if you have specific genomic abnormalities and that you know, can have a gene fusion, which is the case with ALK. Um, and that allowed us to personalize the treatments even more. So we we obviously can diagnose the cancer at different stages. So you might find someone, you know, with an early stage cancer mm-hmm. and they potentially can go for surgery with a curative intent and try to get rid of it altogether. But then a lot of the patients would be diagnosed a little bit later on. And um, and that is a challenge. And although, you know, the, the last time we've done, because we, we do the, the, the lung cancer national audit and we yeah. when we looked at age, you know, the median age of diagnosis of non-small cell in the UK is about 73 years old. So people yeah. tend to be much older. But then there is that subgroup of patients that actually potentially never smoked or smoked very little, and they still have lung cancer, which is really mm-hmm. hard f- for those patients to accept as well. Yeah. Um, but that leads often <clears throat> to delays in diagnosis. Mm. Uh, and ALK, bridging to, to, to the topic, ALK is one of those where yeah. you have population that is a little bit different than that, that average. Mm. Um, 
and you know it has good things uh, and i'll tell you about the good things as yeah. well but um because because if you think about an you know, overall and non-small cell you know these patients if they are picked up with a more advanced stage and that's a lot of what i do at the christie on average you know these patients might be living up to two years some patients obviously will live longer others would sadly live less but once you start finding those molecular subtypes that have those genomic abnormalities that you can target and personalize the treatment to them, mm. those patients tend to live longer. Yeah. So it is really important that we look for them. Yeah, for sure. And I'd like to come on to the kind of the barriers that both, I guess, clinicians and patients both face in terms mm-hmm. of the diagnosis of never smokers, because we've got that rhetoric that's all you know it's been since the 1940s where cancer um where smoking was identified as a carcinogen and um that rhetoric that you know smoking causes cancer and it's kind of it's sometimes seen that you know the only reason that you'd ever have lung cancer is from smoking Mm so from a patient point of view i can understand that that need to correct people and say i've got lung cancer and i've never smoked before um and understanding you know the barriers that are faced there but also the barriers that are faced clinically but we'll come on to that um because i want to ask first about the kind of specifics behind what kind of mutation um alk is so it's an alk alk positive mutation right um so yeah what kind of mutation is that yeah so so you're absolutely right and just to touch on what you were saying before it's the whole system isn't it you're not used to think about lung cancer in someone that never smoked so it's the yeah. whole system from the patient to a gp all the way uh, along the pathway so it is a challenge but um but basically what it is so there are different types of genomic abnormalities um and what happens with the alk is that and this isn't exclusive to lung um but basically it's a fusion between two genes mm-hmm. so you have two genes that you know would function independently and there is a fusion and gets them together and pretty much what that happens is it changes the way the signaling within the cell works mm-hmm. so once that fusion happens that does drive the cancer and does drive those cells because it's giving the constant sign to divide and replicate and yeah. and, and 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 that's where the problem arises because you might have as by default by definition yeah. even cancer is an accumulation of mutations and genomic abnormalities it's not normal but that doesn't mean all the mutations have the same meaning a lot of the mutations are passengers so they will be there they might influence to a degree the behavior of the cancer but they don't necessarily drive it so if you target those mutations the cancer may still continue growing but with with alk we've realized that's one of the driver mutations that Mm -hmm. if you do block that you block the main pathway yeah and you can you know we can't get rid of the cancer by yeah. doing that but you can really shrink it and paralyze it yeah pretty much after that yeah and i know we spoke in a previous episode with colin Lindsay about mm. oncogenic drivers so yeah. it's one of those oncogenic drivers and also this is quite interesting um i read that it's um so a gene the alk gene is switched on in embryos in utero mm-hmm. And that's for the kind of the protein synthesis and the growth of the embryo. And then it switches off before the embryo or then the baby is born. And then in some cases it switches back on and that's where you get that kind of fusion. Is it with the EML? Is that right? The EML gene, EML4 and ALK fuse. And then that causes the proliferation and then the the cancer driver. Um, And I thought that was so interesting because it's, yeah, it's a weird mechanism, but also, another thing is it's not hereditary, is it? It isn't, no. So you won't pass that on to your children. You yeah. know, it, it wasn't your parents' fault. You know, it, yeah. it, ju- it just happened. And I can imagine, you know, with with understanding hereditary um, mutations, it, you know, it's distressing for, say, your children to find out that, you know, that they might have a one in four risk of their parent passing them something on or something. But it also, it's a great indicator um, and it's a great kind of, mechanism to go through early detection and for people to have this this kind of continual screening where if, as if it's not a hereditary mutation you would never know to go to exactly. screening you just so i can understand that there's you know a lot of problems there and i mean just to clarify so the percentage of non-small cell co- cancers that are um out positive is that around five percent probably lower than that but up okay. to five yeah and does that vary population to population like is that just a figure here in the uk or yeah, so what we know is that um, Asians tend mm-hmm. to have a higher prevalence of it, so it is more common there. So if, for example, we have a patient here that has an Asian background, we know that they have a higher chance. So there are a few 
characteristics that we know are a little bit more common. So it's a bit more common in women. Yeah. It's a bit more common in, in younger patients and an Asian background. And then obviously people that never smoked yeah. or have a very light smoking history. So if we see someone that um, got diagnosed recently with lung cancer that never smoked and fits, you know, some of the, this profile, and it's obviously it's not a it's not a perfect profile. There will be people outside of this that still have it. It's yeah. just more common then we we tend to test for because there's a big chance they might have it although as you said it isn't that common yeah so if you think that the alk uh, rearrangement is more common uh and essentially we only see it on adenocarcinoma yeah well adenocarcinoma is a subtype of non-small cell which is a subtype of lung cancer so yeah so you can see we start narrowing this down and it's, yeah. it's quite a small population and we don't really know how many patients we have in the UK with an ALK mutation um, because we don't necessarily test everyone, yeah. especially when they are diagnosed at an early stage. Things are changing, yeah. but that's why we don't really have very accurate figures. We just know that in Asia, it's a little bit more prevalent than yeah. it is around here. Interesting. And I mean, you mentioned a few of the demographics so that are kind of, that have this ALK positive. So you've got um, the under 50 um, women, um, never smokers and things. Do we have any indication as to why those demographics, it might be particularly in those demographics, or is that one of the research questions that's kind of continuing to find out why it's these particular demographics that are presenting with this mutation? I mean, short answer is I don't know, and I don't know if, if we have very good evidence on, on the reasoning yeah. for that, but that's an interesting point. And I, th I think one of the challenges is, because it's not something you screen the large groups of people to be mm. able to really understand the distribution makes it a little bit hard so you could always say there are some bias potentially in some of that but definitely yeah there there are groups there the reasoning we still i don't think we know yeah the number of people that are diagnosed um with never smoking lung cancer is kind of on the rise at the minute and there's um, proportionally um and i think that's because you know there's this um dissemination that smoking is bad and I think the marketing is kind of working mm. for that. And the proportion therefore is shifting. So never smokers are becoming a more representative um, percentage of that um, cohort of lung cancer patients. And I mean, I guess what my one of my questions would be, what would we classify as this never smoker um, within that kind of demographic? Yeah, I mean, you can use different definitions, but the most widely used is someone that smoked less than 100 cigarettes in their life okay. and they aren't currently smoking. So that, is, that would be the definition of a never smoker. Um, but I would argue that even someone that is a very light smoker, uh, which more than 100, you know, still the impact, I'm not saying, you know, it's it's all fine until 100 cigarettes and yeah. then 101, there's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously <laughs> that's not the case, but even light smokers, we would still think of them, well, actually, you're quite a light smoker and you yeah. have this advanced lung cancer. We still follow that same rationale of testing, yeah. prioritizing for those patients to get tested as well. Yeah. Because, for example, we do test quite widely for adenocarcinomas, but not necessarily for squamous. But if you see someone with a squamous, that, you know, it's very unlikely they'll have a target mutation. But if they've never smoked or very light smokers, we would test. Okay. And what, what stage along the diagnosis is that testing pathway? Like, when does that happen? Is that kind of when they're, I mean, identified as a non-small cell lung cancer or? Yeah. So, so, so the first step, we'll try to get some histology. So the patients will get a biopsy. We'll see what, you know, what type of cancer it is. We know it's lung. And then if we know it's non-small cell, then if it's adeno, we, we would test for them. If it's not adeno and it's squamous, we don't necessarily test for everyone, but things are changing and we are testing more and more. But definitely if they would be um, never smokers or light smokers, we would. We would test for everyone following what I've just said. If you have a diagnosis of um, advanced lung cancer, so mm -hmm. you have a stage four, you're coming most likely to the Christie or a Withenshaw, for example, are the two main ones that will get patients uh, in the region. Uh, we would test for those patients. But if you are diagnosed at an earlier stage, then we may not do that test because they may not that may not necessarily change what we could offer to that patient yeah. because the treatments targeting the ALK that are currently approved are for advanced metastatic okay. stage. So if you are you know, diagnosed at a stage one and you get a surgery, knowing you have that ALK mutation, you know, it's important, useful information, but doesn't really affect your care at that stage, mm -hmm. but it might affect your care later on if your cancer comes back. Yeah. And I mean, I've read that I think it's around 90% of people 
um, without positive lung cancer are diagnosed at stage four. So that's a big cohort, mm. All right? Um, and what's the treatment options for those people when they are presenting at stage four without positive? Yeah, let me go back just on one yeah, thing yeah, you just said, because, <laughs> because that's a really relevant fact, yeah. isn't it? That the majority of those patients are diagnosed later on, but you can see why that is the case, because probably this is that group that is younger, is fitter, probably never smoked, has been having some symptoms for a while, but mm-hmm. no one is really thinking, not even you know, not the person or, or the GP are mm-hmm. thinking about might be lung cancer. And I think that contributes quite quite a lot for the fact that you get diagnosis done a bit later when the cancer is more advanced as well. So it's not yeah. necessarily that the cancer will be more aggressive because you have that. Mm-hmm. It's just because there's that delay in diagnosis yeah. because you just don't fit the profile of someone yeah. with lung cancer. And that, that makes it really challenging. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to touch on that later. Okay, just sneak okay. Peek, but yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but what was the... Oh, the treatment, the, yeah, sorry. the treatment options. <laughs> um, so, so basically, we, as I was mentioning before, we, we developed treatments um, that would target that. So basically, what we want is to target that pathway. What I often describe to patients is think of this as, you know, this is, this is a subway. And you want to go from station A to B. And, you know, the signals are passing within a cancer cell and there are multiple, there are multiple lines within the cancer cells, well, within any cell, to send signals around. And you may sometimes block one pathway, but you can use another one to get the message. But if you do have one of those driver mutations, that is that pathway that is being used primarily. So what you do with the treatments is that we're going to target, and that's why we call them the targetable treatments, mm-hmm. that we target that pathway, we target that mutation, and we pretty much we block that. Okay. But the reason why this isn't going to get rid of the cancer is at some point you'll develop resistance mechanism, or the cancer will, and we'll find a way for the, the message to get to the destination, mm-hmm. but just using another line on that subway. And that's why I think one of the things that is really, really important is this is really tough for someone that, you know, just been diagnosed and all the implications that that might have in their life and the treatment, which might be really good. And I would say it's really, it's really good. And we have a few of them and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that. Um, only go so far. You can't yeah. really get rid of the cancer. It's very unlikely. You no, know, the cancer would just disappear because at some point you'll develop those mm. resistance mechanisms and you can just bypass that primary line and use a yeah. secondary line to get to that destination. So the message gets there. Um, but that might take years. And that is that is the good thing amongst all of this is that mm. a lot of these patients might live a lot longer. So yeah. if I was saying before that, you know, on, on average, someone with advanced lung cancer, non-small cell might be looking at it two years, yeah. this patient might be looking at six, seven years. So, okay. so it does change things quite a yeah. bit. And we do have, so we have uh, thyrosine kinase inhibitors that are pretty much blocking that pathway. Yeah. Um, and we came a long way. So we have more and more drugs available. Yeah. Um, so we try as best as we can. Once one fails, try to switch to another oh, one. Yeah. But um, And these are tablets, so the patients would take them home with them and take them every day. Mm. They tend to be very well tolerated for most patients. So, um, And that's, you know, what, what as an oncologist, that's what I like to see because what yeah. I want to see is someone that is doing their medication, not impacting their life too much for most patients. The vast majority will have a benefit, so the tumor tends to shrink. So if they had symptoms, they tend to improve and then they can have that long lasting benefit. And yeah. at some point, yeah, at some point and prepared patients for that, that treatment will fail at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, but things evolved so, so quickly. I remember when I, when I started um, at the Christie, uh, we had one drug and that was that one drug. Now we have second and third. And yeah. So we have so many drugs now available yeah. um, that, you know, it's, 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 it's really encouraging. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's hard to tell to patients what we have, because obviously yeah. you want to know what happens when this fails. And I said, because it might take a while for this to fail. I don't know what I'll have available then, yeah. because I may have more than what I have now. And that's yeah. really, really good for us, makes it a lot, a lot better, but for patients gives them a lot of options. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so are they, are they ALK inhibitors, the yeah. drugs, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so they bind to the ALK and then stop the reproduction of the cancer cells, yeah. but they don't necessarily diminish the size of the tumour. So we will. You okay. will. So they tend to shrink, but they tend to reach a plateau where yeah. it doesn't shrink anymore and then and then stabilises there. Okay. Um, and then we keep an eye. So we do regular scans. So every three months, patients are having scans and then they can stay on that plateau where the cancer is, is quiet, yeah. isn't changing much. 
and we just carry on with the treatment. And then okay. at some point, one of the areas that we already knew had cancer restart growing or something new start popping somewhere mm -hmm. else. And then, then we'll see something has changed. Yeah. But sometimes not all of the sites with cancer change because you might develop some resistance in one area, but not on the other areas. So yeah. you may have you know other parts of your tumor stay, but some parts start growing. And that's when you realize, I think we're starting to lose control with this treatment. Yeah. And is that what you're referring to? Is that like first line treatment, second line treatment, third line treatment, yeah. and that's how you progress down the pathway? Yeah, exactly. And that's either through increasing the um, dose of the primary drug that you're giving or introducing another drug? So we wouldn't increase the dose. Okay. So we, we start with optimal dose. Yeah. We might reduce if the patient has side effects, but okay. we start with optimal dose. And with these treatments, you know, it's not like, because chemotherapy, for example, we calculate the dose based on the height, the weight, so we can calculate the body surface, yeah. how well your kidneys work to, you know, cleanse your body from it. Um, but with this type of drugs, no, you know, it's like almost if you think about um, you know, blood pressure tablet, yeah. that you start to that medication, unless you have side effects, then we reduce, but everyone pretty much gets the same upfront. Okay. So it's the same with this. And if you realize that at some point, you know, the cancer seems to be growing, there's something new, that treatment is failing, we switch. Okay. So we switch for something else. We don't necessarily add something on top of it mm -hmm. or increase the dose. We just switch. Yeah. And I mean, it's so exciting to think that if a patient, say, kind of that a drug is working, so the first line treatment is working for three years, the second mm. line treatment is working for three years, and then, you know, by the time seven years has elapsed, there might be those new options that are kind of circulating in the UK. And it's just it's yeah. so exciting to think of that because yeah. the the kind of the option list just grows. Yeah, it has grown tremendously over the past few years. And then you have clinical trials as well. So yeah. the drug might not yet approved, but you know, and it may never be, but at least it's in development and you can have trial to offer to patients. And then, you know, and when all that fails, you still have more the traditional chemotherapy as a potential yeah. option. Obviously, it's a very different type of treatment, uh, you know, and the patients might want it or, or not. Um, but we'd also have that option as, as more that that classic treatment yeah. it's still an option but that's that was all we had a few years ago and you can see how we completed we we flipped this so we yeah. we're targeting so we can personalize that and once all that fails yeah. uh, and and we don't longer have options then we we revert back yeah. to what we had before which was the chemo so i mean like just looking at um out positive lung cancer would you be able to kind of go through some of the symptoms that a never smoker might expect from that type of lung cancer? Yeah, um, it, it would be the same. Uh, okay. So so it will be the general symptom. So you may have, you know, a cough that doesn't go away. Yeah. And that often you might get an antibiotic uh, thinking, you know, it's a chest infection that doesn't really clear and the cough continues. So a cough is, is an important sign. Um, then sometimes you might start feeling a little bit more breathless. That mm -hmm. is another important sign there. Pain might happen. Um, is not perhaps as common because it depends where the tumor is growing because if it's yeah. growing in the center of your chest, you don't really feel anything. But it's, if it's growing close to your rib cage, then, then you yeah. can feel pain in that area. So you can feel that discomfort yeah. growing that doesn't really go away. That sometimes it'll be worse at night. So it's that type of pattern of pain. But it's perhaps not as common as the other two. Um, and then there's the obvious that people get very frightened is if they cough uh, some blood. Yeah. So if there's any blood there, something is something is wrong. It doesn't mean that you know if someone coughs up blood, equals cancer. Yeah. But obviously that is an alert sign, and I think people are quite aware of that. I think people yeah. get very scared with that. But a cough that is lingering, perhaps you pay less attention if you know if you're told probably just a chest infection. Yeah. And sometimes you know sometimes it takes weeks for someone to completely get rid of a cough after they had a chest infection. Mm. So, you know, but if that cough continues and, you know, four weeks have passed, eight weeks have passed, clearly that isn't normal if, you yeah. know, if you are a healthy person. Yeah. But it, it can be easy to ignore if yeah. you think, well, I'm young. I've never smoked. Um, you know, I went to the GP, got, got some antibiotics, yeah. and it might have given you a false sense of even an improvement, but it just yeah. doesn't go away. Yeah, a bit of a that's placebo. when you should. Yeah, that's when you should. And I think it's more about that awareness that actually mm. as you were saying you only need lungs to get lung cancer so if yeah. something isn't adding up even if you've never smoked you should be considering yeah and going to the gp that's the thing i you know i had a cough throughout pretty much all of uni <laughs> <laughs> and I, you just never consider it mm. and um i think that's probably you know one of the barriers for a lot of people mm. is i mean especially with covid as well right you were mm. 
kind of advised not to go into GPs if you had a persistent mm. cough. Whereas, you know, that's a indicative sign of um, lung cancer and it's it's quite imperative that you are seen by the GP pretty yeah. quickly. So it's it's a weird, mm. weird kind of thing to work with, I guess. Um, and but, it's challenging, isn't it? Because yeah. if you put yourself even on the GP shoes, you know, you're definitely not thinking, you no, know, you have cough equals cancer yeah. and, and you don't go you know, into screening programs or you don't go in having all scans because of that. And and you as a as a person might go there once because you have that cough. It didn't really clear, but you may not go again. Yeah. So, you know, I can see how it is a, almost a little bit unfair as well and challenging for the GP who have a snapshot of yeah. that person and say, well, you, you don't fit the profile. Yeah. You don't have any risk factors. So, so their decision isn't wrong sometimes of not investigating. So I, I do think it goes both ways. Yeah, yeah. You completely. need to say, well, you know, I know myself well. You no, know, something is off. Yeah. So I, and then and then having that conversation yeah. with your GP to get things going. Yeah, having that autonomy in yeah. your own body. And obviously, yeah. you know, you may have cough for a long time, yeah. and you know, you may have other health problems. You know, you yeah. may, you may find out you actually have asthma or something else. Yeah. You know, there are other things. Yeah. So, and that's, that's when it gets a bit trickier. Yeah, I can imagine. And I want to come on to the education side, because that's obviously what you're working on. But I mean, yeah, another thing to flag is, um, there was just talking about public campaigns, the Ruth Strauss Foundation. Mm. So if you heard of it? Yeah. yeah. So it was Sarah um, and Andrew Strauss, I want to say, mm. um, founded um, on behalf of his wife, um, Ruth Strauss, and she was a never smoker um, and had out positive lung cancer and um, sadly died of that. And he set up this foundation in her memory and to kind of raise public awareness and things. And um, Rankin, the photographer, has done a campaign with never smokers and um, their kind of CT scans and stuff. And it looks amazing, but it's it's understanding the benefit of work like that in relaying that message that you only need lungs to get lung cancer, you know, it is you you need some autonomy in terms of your healthcare and pushing forward on that but understanding your symptoms could be other things rather than just kind of your immediate response of oh maybe it's pneumonia maybe it's a chest mm-hmm. infection um so you know we'll come on to your work as well because it's all incredible but that that's some really good work that i just i think is incredible as well okay. and i mean coming on to you specifically mm-hmm. um could you tell me a bit about your work on the uk alk project yeah, yeah yeah so um so a few years ago so this is so this has probably like two phases so the, a few years ago we've set up an ALK project that was pretty much a bit of a national database because we realized that things were changing so quickly, you know, more mm-hmm. treatments were getting available, more patients were coming through our doors. Um, how are we ensuring that all of this knowledge and all the access to these trials and new drugs is, you know, is happening across the country? Because, you know, Christie is a big center. We end up, although this is relatively unusual, this type of, of, of lung cancer, we end up seeing reasonable numbers because of the sheer size of, of the hospital. But if you think of some smaller centers, you may have colleagues who have never s- treated mm-hmm. someone with, with an ALK um, lung cancer. So we felt, well, let's engage with oncologists across the UK and this, you know, beyond England um, and get data in. Mm-hmm. And it was really, really interesting to see. And, you know, people were really eager because I think I might have mentioned before, you know, we do that national lung cancer audit, but we don't really have the granularity yeah. of the ALK specific outcomes, et cetera. So it's, it's everyone as a whole, we just separate non-small cell from small cell pretty yeah. much. So, but there people are really eager to understand what was happening. So, so we've started there, collected a lot of data, realized that, you know, as we suspected in a good way, these patients were living a lot longer than, than what we were used to see before. But we realized that perhaps it was a bit disjointed yeah. because it was a landscape that was changing very quickly and it wasn't a very common landscape. So people may not be entirely aware. And this was this was quite a few years ago. Um, but that highlighted that need. And I do think things improved quite a bit now because yeah. art became a very... Um, interesting topic and you know the more and more treatments are available it became much more popular in that sense so i do i do think the awareness has increased quite a lot within within oncology um but it flagged that actually there were issues with you know, the late diagnosis there were issues sometimes in making sure that even the more specialist teams were aware of all the developments so so more recently on the back of that we felt that 
we should invest in education. Yeah. So we've we've put so we got got a good collaboration going on between you know, colleagues from the MCRC, School of Oncology, myself, the Christie, and we've put a, a grant together and and secured some funding with the Pfizer support um, to develop a whole educational uh, program mm -hmm. that would be uh, tailored, you know, not just you know at the, at the specialized oncology teams, but also thinking about the GP, thinking about yeah. patients. Um, and that's why, as part of that, we are partnering now with the, the with the um, the national um, patient, um, the ALK UK. Yeah. So it's a patient advocate group. So it's, yeah. it's really important that they have a voice there as well and they help shape the program. So it's something we are just about to start, but it's really exciting. And I think it, it grew from that yeah. that we realized we needed to get that platform of education uh, out there. Fab, and I'll link out Positive UK because I think that's what you referenced that UK Alk project mm -hmm. that then led to this fruition of the Alk educational program. Yeah. And that's the Christie School of Oncology, um, the Christie and the MCRC, which is Manchester Cancer Research Centre. Yeah. And so you're the clinical lead for that. Yeah. And there's other educational kind of components. So, I mean, what does the educational component of that project involve more specifically? Like how, who, who is it targeted at? What, who are those kind of discrete groups and how is it going to kind of Im be implemented, I guess? Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of things we still don't know because we're going to be working on that over time, but we've already agreed that we want three layers. We want yeah. the layer that is, that is, tailored and targeted at, at the patient. Mm -hmm. And then there is the layer that is targeted at the, at the GPs primarily, so primary care. And then the third layer is the more specialized layer that is targeted at essentially oncology teams. Yeah. Not, no, not just the medics, but the whole of the um, uh, multidisciplinary team, the nurses, etc. cetera. Uh, so those are the three layers and those are the three targets. And we keen to have one single platform that depending on who you are, then you can access the layer that is more relevant to you. So the level yeah. of information would be tailored to that and the focus would be tailored to, to you as well. Yeah. Um, and then the way that we're going to deliver that, I think a lot of that we're still discussing and seeing what, what is the most efficient way. And I think a very hybrid model probably will work best yeah. where we have some more, more traditional, uh, here I am talking about a topic or you can have something a bit more interactive as well. Yeah. Um, so we still don't know all the specifics. So we, we are now building. So we've built the skeleton of the topics we want to cover, agreed on who the target is. Now we're def defining how best to deliver this in a way that, you know, we managed to keep that up to date as much as possible. We managed to get, you know, a good reach with the content. Um, and you know, and we get the right people involved. Yeah. Um, so we are inviting now other clinicians to get in on board as well. Uh, so I'll be one of them by getting more clinicians involved, getting patients involved. Yeah. I think that's really, really essential. Yeah. And I do think, and we all agree within the project that having the patient voice there to help shape the content, not just the content that is targeted at the patient, but the content that is targeted at the GP or targeted yeah. at, the, at the specialized oncology teams, yeah. getting that voice is really important. Yeah, and I think especially understanding from the patient's perspective what barriers they experienced. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even in terms of, I think there's kind of a, a commonality whereby if somebody is diagnosed um, with lung cancer as a never smoker, their first port of call is to say to somebody, oh, I never smoked. Mm -hmm. Well, the first question is from kind of Joe, Joe Public, did you smoke? Yeah. Um, and it's it's understanding removing that and removing the stigma and understanding as a GP or an oncologist that people do experience um, barriers and some of them may be in the form of a stigma and just having a patient to communicate that and the kind of the importance to them of breaking down those barriers is just yeah it's incredible and having those kind of three groups working together you know your patients your oncologists your GPs mm. is really really powerful it's like a tripartite of greatness yeah, yeah no I agree and and we, we had a meeting um, maybe a month ago and uh, one of the, the patient advocates was 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 talking about you no know, the things you don't really reflect but if you if you if you are diagnosed with with cancer earlier on in your life the the impact is different than if you're diagnosed later on in your life mm. um, so you know it might affect your it will affect your chance of for example you know, getting a loan getting a mortgage so yeah. it paralyzes a lot of aspects of your life and you know it's quite significant. One of my one of my patients um, is is life's passion is to play a clarinet. 
So it's something that really, really, really is something that not only he loves, mm. but also he teach. He was teaching kids, and that was a source of income as well. And then you know, suddenly you, you couldn't breed that well. Yeah. So so you not only stop doing something you love, but you also stop doing something that provides you an income. And I remember we started uh, started the patient on, on the treatment, you know, and there was a and there was an improvement over time. And then there was one day that I got an invite to go to his concert. And that was his first concert since yeah. he had been diagnosed. You know, that was so significant. And I felt like, oh, you know, I didn't tell him that I was going because I felt yeah. that, oh, imagine something happens and then I don't show up. That that would, yeah. that would be terrible. So I didn't say anything, but I, I went to his first concert and he spotted me in the crowd. Mm. And then he came to me, you know, and just, just so happy that I went there. But he was so happy that he was able to play again. And not yeah. only, you know, he managed to get back doing the things he loves doing, but also you know, they give provide him an income. So yeah. he managed to get his life back. And I, I know, and this isn't to say that you know if you are older, then you know a diagnosis has less of an impact, but it has a different impact yeah, because completely. you are at different yeah. uh, times in in your life. Yeah. And and you know that that point made by by that patient saying you know you are a young family and you can't get a mortgage. You know yeah. all those things because we might say, but it's okay. You no. Know, you can live for many years with these treatments, yeah. but still your life can be paralyzed. Yeah. And and if the cancer, for example, had spread to your brain, you can't drive for at least a year, which might have huge implications for yeah. your line of work, etc. Yeah. So you can, you, yeah, so absolutely. Getting the patients involved in that voice provides a perspective that yeah. is really, really important. Yeah. And I mean, as well, I, I guess the, the family aspect as well, you're more likely to have a kind of dependence when you're, you know, that age and... Mm having dependence is so stressful because you know they're completely reliant on you and your your kind of financial stability yeah you have that ripped out from under you and you don't know where to go from there so I can understand it's a completely different landscape that people are navigating yeah like you say it's not saying that one's lesser than the other or less stressful it's just a completely different stage in your life that you're in and understanding those younger patient groups must be really helpful for those patients as well and looking at likewise people in a room where you're kind of you the thing that's drawing you together is that you know, you've all been diagnosed with cancer and it might be this out positive cancer at a very young age. It's not hereditary. It came from late diagnosis and you're trying to deal with it. And having that community group must be so, so important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, I guess you learn a lot from your patients as well, don't you? Yeah. And, you know, it, it, for us, it, it makes it all worth it as well, because obviously yeah. some, sometimes it can be quite challenging. Um, but seeing and, and I think, you know, seeing that this treatment's Sadly, they don't work for everyone, for, but the vast majority, they will work. Um, so in seeing that benefit, seeing yeah. how you can sort of get your life back on track, yeah. um, you know, it may not be forever and ever, but the, that, that ability of giving you more time, mm. that, you know, that, is, that is brilliant. And seeing your patients getting back to their, to their normal lives, yeah. um, that, is, yeah, that, yeah. that makes it all worth it. Yeah. And you see quite often that people switch that mentality. You know, I've known people with um, cancer and family members, as kind of everyone does with the the way that it is, like one in two. But the mentality switches to that. Well, in my experience, every day is a bonus. Mm. So then, when you're presenting somebody with a treatment strategy that's you know promising them kind of so many years, it's you know such a relief for them that it's not this death sentence straight yeah. away, which is I bet so lovely for you. Yeah, and just yeah. oncologists try as much as possible to avoid promises. <laughs> yeah, not promising, <laughs> no promises. But yeah. Uh, but but yeah, but patients do have a good chance. Yeah. So that's and that's important that they know as well up front that you know, there's a good chance. Yeah. But we need to get started to see you know is is this going to work? But there's a good chance it will. So, yeah. 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 No promises. But no promises. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a genie. I can't promise anything. Um, and I mean, previously you mentioned Gateway C, so that's. Mm an educational component of the Christie, is it the School of Oncology that it's yeah. within? Um, could you tell me a little bit more about that? And if you envisage this, um, the kind of outputs from this ALK education program being fed into that? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And uh, I don't think we've, we've you know, determined everything about the program yet. We've just secured the funding and we, we're working to, to get things going. Um, we're definitely very keen to use the machinery around Gateway C yeah. because there's a lot of know-how already there on how to best to deliver a lot of this. 
Um, I don't think we've agreed necessarily, is this going to sit within Gateway C? Is this going to be linked somehow with it? I don't think we came to that to that decision just yet. But I'm um, really, really keen. What we want is for that to be, you know, as accessible as possible, reaching mm-hmm. the right people. So very happy for that to happen if that is the best way or having that in two different routes of yeah. access. All of that to, to me and I guess to all, all the others, we're very flexible about it. But definitely there is a there is a skill set and a know-how and a whole platform that we really want to tackle into. And so Gateway C definitely is very key for us to be able to develop this, yeah. well, the whole machinery around around it. Uh, I don't think we just decided just yet where where do we make it all available. Yeah. So you said in terms of the content, and that would be like a kind of hybrid-esque sort of thing, what would that look like for an oncologist? Would that be educational materials for them that would be looking out for certain symptoms and um, the kind of care pathway i don't know what yeah so i think there, there will be different things but um i think for the for the more specialized oncology teams a lot of it could be around the decision making in certain circumstances that are a little bit trickier so for example yeah. sometimes patients develop upfront brain metastasis or a little bit later on how to tackle this you know the radiotherapy to the brain we've discussed before switching the treatment that has better penetration in the brain so all those considerations i think mm-hmm can be quite challenging so a focus on that decision making on what could be the best options on the table for the patients particularly in very special circumstances i think that will be a big focus another could be on managing some of the side effects of of some of these treatments could be another area that we're focusing and then there's an element of how is this perhaps impacting the patients and bring more awareness from the patient side on yeah. on 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 that so there there will be there will be different layers yeah. but for example you can imagine that you know that decision making content is less relevant or is not relevant for the GPs because they wouldn't be engaging you know at that level yeah. because you no know, they wouldn't be making that decision so that's why the content needs to be tailored so that you are tailoring the content for the right audience yeah do you see it as kind of a good exemplar that could be translated to other disease groups, this educational program? Because, I mean, it could be useful for countless, like even different hereditary cancers and things like that. Yeah, I, 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 I do feel that when you have a tumour or a subtype of tumour that is a little bit more rare, it yeah. gets really challenging. Yeah. Um, not just, you know, because... I may have something in my trust from a trial that the other trust may not have, and now we have better platforms to find out about trials across across the UK yeah. that you know may not be open in your in your hospital. But more than that is, are we can we say for sure that we are on top of all the developments in that area, which is quite rare, and you, we may not see as many of those patients. Um, and that doesn't mean all those patients need to be referred every time to a specialist center. Sometimes you know they can be seen at their at their more local hospitals, which mm-hmm. a lot of patients would prefer instead of having to travel a long way. Yeah. How can you empower those teams as well to feel confident in having yeah. access to that information, considering how busy you know, everyone is as well. So I do feel that specifically for you know, rare tumors or rare subtypes of tumors, that, that would have a lot of potential. Yeah, I think kind of going on next, it's a question that I like to ask everyone. Um, and it's... Um, how does it feel to work within this um, kind of like sector of cancer research and know that you're benefiting the lives of your patients? Oh, should have prepared for that question. Uh, <laughs> everyone always freezes. They're like, well... <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's it's hard to answer. I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. And, and, yeah. I do, and I do feel that, as I was saying at the beginning, that there is a lot of, there is a lot of know-how around. I don't know, I like you know I, i'm i feel confident in certain elements of it but you know yeah. there are elements of the research that i wouldn't be very you know you don't you don't put me in the lab and I, I i would just find it all very interesting but i wouldn't know what to do there so there is a lot of different know-how already there and i think manchester does provide you that that um that support and that opportunity yeah. to do things in this space so you know um i think there is probably a lot more that I could be doing that we could be doing but um, I think the sum of the little steps is, is, yeah. is a big thing and I can see a lot happening in this space 
So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but uh, oh, you're answering a question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was okay. God, there'll be no need for me soon. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's incredible work, and I'm so impressed. And it's so great that you've got this funding mm. and that you're pushing forward with this educational component because I think that is one of the most integral things. You can do the research, you can you know do the clinical trials, but if it's not communicated to the public, the clinicians, the GPs, then it's, you know, sitting dead in the water. So it's yeah. so important to have that to facilitate the new conversations and have that group of, yeah, the tripartite that communicate and trans translate each other's yeah. messages. Cause and it, getting the right people around you, because, yeah. you know, in all fairness, because uh, and that's really important to acknowledge that you know we got that 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 funding and we have this plan. But you know, although I may come with the sort of the clinician hat on for this, you know, it, it's really only possible. It's only moving forward because you know we have the director for School of Oncology um, at the Christie that is really supportive and behind this, and then we have leads in education like Rachel Chan that is really driving this as well. So yeah. you you get the right people around you because you know, if it would be me, I would just say, oh, we should talk more about this, we should do something. But then <laughs> then the whole delivering of an educational program, you know, it's way beyond yeah. you know, w what I feel more confident and comfortable. So you really need to get the right people around you to support that. Uh, and that's the key thing. And that's the key thing. It's not just finding the funding. It's finding the funding and the right people around yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's perhaps what I... I know I've said that a couple of times, but that's what I like about Manchester is that you end up having, you get the Linkwood University just up the road and then you have the Linkwood MCRC and then you have, and you have yeah. all these different people uh, with very different skill sets that can quickly get together and, and, and get a project up and running. And that's, yeah. that's brilliant. Yeah, it is incredible. Like the diaspora of people here is just incredible. Yeah, yeah. You only have to get talking for a bit and you've <laughs> looped yeah. into some of the yeah. blooming projects. And you've mentioned the uni. Were you a student at the uni? So, so I did a I did a research. Uh, so I did a uh, um, I did a master's an MRIS. I did an MRIS yeah. in the uni uh, on experimental cancer medicine. So I did that, but I I did my training in MIMD back back in Lisbon. So, uh, but yeah, but I got that link and uh, yeah, and then. Beyond that, as a as for some time as a as a as a student as well, is all the links you build on your yeah. professional side because yeah. we we end up collaborating because you know no one someone knows someone and then suddenly you are engaging with that person with that person. I think uh, perhaps the majority of my links with university came outside of that student um, yeah. sphere, perhaps and different interactions along along the years. Um, but there's always been a really good collaboration and good interaction. So I think that it, it built yeah. and, and grew from yeah. that. Oh, great stuff. And do you know of any um, other oncogenic drivers that drive non-small cell lung cancers? There are quite a few now. Oh, uh, so yeah, <laughs> things are changing and that's so why... So never smoking non-small cell lung cancers, well, sorry. it doesn't have to be, you know, I think... You can look at it different ways. I would argue yeah. that you know, if someone never smoked, they have a higher chance of having no. If they didn't smoke, why do they have lung cancer? They yeah. probably have one of those driver mutations, that, and that is the reason why they have it. There are a lot of those that we just don't know about them, so we can't test for them. And there might be some that you know, we test for, and we find, but we still don't have a, a treatment for. So, so it it is what it is. But there are a few that uh, beyond ALK that we test routinely for. So EGFR we test routinely for. Yeah. We have ROS1, we have BRAF, we have MET. So there have yeah. been more and more that we have treatments for and that we test routinely. ALK is definitely one of them. And perhaps ALK has that, that cohort of patients that are a little bit younger. Yeah. But all of this are common in people that never smoke. But again, yeah. it doesn't mean that you know, if you have a smoking history, we're not going to test. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah. will. And we'll find people that smoked and have one of these positive hits yeah. on the tests. I think the argument is... If someone never smoked uh, or is a very light smoker, we definitely should be testing, should be testing. because you know if they weren't yeah. exposed to tobacco, then why why do they yeah. why did they develop? So we really need to do the best we can to run tests, and yeah. we can do some of those tests in blood samples and tissue. Because sometimes when we have tissue, we may not have enough to run all the tests. Yeah. Sometimes we re biopsy, and you would have a stronger argument to try to do as best as you can to run the full panel in patients that never smoked. But yeah. yeah, but there are more more targets, and pretty sure that the number of targetable targets <laughs> will will increase over the years. Yeah, God, just more knowledge. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today. It's honestly been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks and for having I me. I really appreciate you taking time out of the clinic. 
um to speak with me because it's just yeah it's great i love it (laughs) and um yeah it's nice to shift that perception of lung cancer as a smoking disease and working with you on this and i can't wait to hear more there's gonna be more don't you worry as as we get more out there yeah so go and have a blooming fabulous day hope it's sunny and it reminds you you of portugal but doesn't make you want to go back (laughs) so thank you so much to the fabulous fabio this is his name If you have been affected by anything you've heard in this episode, please see the show notes for a list of charities and organisations that can help. One in Two was brought to you by the University of Manchester and the Manchester Cancer Research Centre. Listen to our next episode to hear from more of our researchers as they share the innovations, discoveries and projects that are changing the landscape of cancer prevention, early detection and treatment. Heard today, please see the show notes for this episode where you'll find a transcript and links to further information and research. Cancer is one of the university's five research beacons, showcasing the interdisciplinary collaborations and cross-sector partnerships that are tackling some of the biggest questions facing the planet. To hear more about Manchester's research in advanced materials, biotechnology, cancer, energy and global inequalities, go to manchester.ac.uk forward slash beacons.